Good afternoon, everybody. Can you all see me and hear me, I hope? Yes. Okay. I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar series um, on Diplomacy in Action. This is a virtual roundtable series. This, today's webinar is one of those and is about EU-Russian energy relations in an international context. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Andrei Belli and Dr. Olga Khrushcheva to be speaking today on this topic. Um, Olga is a lecturer in politics at the Manchester Metropolitan University and her research examines a lot about the EU-Russian relations and Russian energy policy in particular. Uh, Andre is a senior researcher at the Institute of Government and Politics at the University of Tartu and he is an affiliated scholar at the Centre for EU-Russian Studies. He also is a visiting honorary lecturer at the Centre for Energy, Petroleum, Mineral Law and Policy at the University of Dundee. So today, Andre and Olga, Olga will discuss EU-Russian energy relations in an international context and now and into the future. So with past crises in gas transit issues and current events in the Ukraine and Crimea, coupled with other contexts such as climate change, changes in international trade and energy, this is definitely a hot topic. Um, the program for today will be that Andre will start the discussion. He will speak for about 20 minutes. Um, next, Olga will comment and respond to his, uh, his uh, presentation with her own comments and opinions. And then we should have time, and maybe 20 minutes hopefully at, most, at, at least, for questions at the end. If you would like to pose a question, you can type that in the chat section, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. So, Andre, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for organizing the seminar and giving me the floor. So indeed the subject is uh, extremely interesting, especially we would look at uh, uh, the governance issues which uh, are now challenged uh, with the current events. Uh, we are talking though about EU-Russia relations and about EU-Russia interdependence in energy. Uh, and it's actually not uh, a surprise to anyone that actually the current events that you hear now in uh, Ukraine, especially around uh, Crimea, uh, put a lot of uh, pressure on the EU-Russia energy relations. However, we can see that uh, neither of the actors, uh, European Union or Russia, really use the energy as a point of pressure on each other. So that's quite an interesting point that Russia, for example, at least explicitly, does not intend to use energy against the European Union. Neither, apparently, against Ukraine. In turn, the European Union does not establish or doesn't aim to establish any sanctions related to the energy imports from Russia, unlike, for example, the case of uh, Iran. Why is that? Because EU-Russia energy relations are composed from both a positive interdependence and a negative interdependence. A positive interdependence consists actually of an increasing trade volumes of uh, mutual vulnerabilities related to both economic and financial interdependencies, as well as best practice transfers, which are quite important. And at the same time, we observe a negative interdependency, which already existed before, far before, long before the current uh, Ukrainian crisis. So negative interdependency mostly cover gas markets. And is an object of a deinstitutionalization of relationship between Russia and the European Union, which increase the political risks in the energy sector. And again, if we imagine the worst case scenario happens, gas markets will be hit first. So up to now, we observed three forms of the EU-Russia energy governance. They can be defined as follow. 
the level of binding multilateral institutions, in particular, and first of all, the Energy Charter Treaty. The second level is rather bilateral, which somehow touches the internal policies, because the bilateral relations as established between Russia and the European Union aimed at informing each other about the domestic policies and energy field. And then finally, industry-based governance, which is reflected within the Gas Advisory Council. First of all, let's start with the Energy Charter Treaty. A few words about it. The Energy Charter Treaty is the first and the most overarching institution governing energy relations. It, in, it uh, contains uh, four main steps of governance, starting from trade, where basically trade relations supposes non-discrimination, most favorable um, uh, nation clause, access to technologies, and basically most of the uh, gut rules. Then the second one is investment, which is quite interesting because it provides the most uh, global, the most comprehensive set of um, instruments related to the investment protection, including the state investor dispute settlement mechanism. Note that the Energy Charter Treaty somehow substitutes a number of bilateral investment treaties in the sense of protecting the investment. And there is no other multilateral uh, treaty covering investment protection in such a broad market. Then transit. And transit um, is a third quite important um, strap of governance, which basically aims at facilitating access to transit pipelines and also facilitating building of new transport capacities. And uh, here there were in the energy charter, there are in the energy charter some mediation mechanisms, and we also had transit conflicts in 2006 and in 2009, and again between Russia and, the European, oh, and, between Russia and Ukraine. However, these transit mechanisms, dispute settlement mechanisms, were not used, and they were not used for serious political reasons. One of them is that um, transit uh, mediation mechanisms suppose that a mediator is assigned and this mediator sets the levels of volumes and of tariffs for a time of dispute settlement resolution. And that has been always either unclear or unacceptable for Russian and Ukrainian gas companies. Because the transit dispute actually is about the volumes and the tariffs. What might happen now? If, let's say, Ukraine decides to block the access to underground storage, or Russia decides to stop the energy flows through Ukraine, we again will not see that mechanisms be used. The highly politicized matter makes the states avoiding the dispute settlement mechanisms, especially these mediation mechanisms. As far as the energy, as a force trap is concerned, the energy efficiency, well, it's uh, actually quite a cooperative minded uh, set of instruments which are not legally binding and they are not covered with dispute settlement mechanisms. So, now a few words about the reasons of the multilateral 
energy governance weaknesses. And one of the reasons is the high level of securitization in EU-Russia energy relations. So it would not be uh, a secret to anyone to, to know that the Energy Charter Treaty was actually started um, in 1990 and the first Energy Charter Declaration was concluded in 1991 during the, the disintegration of the Soviet Union and during the first steps at the European Union level in energy and which actually also was um, characterized by a number of other multilateral um, declarations such as Paris Charter, Bond Declaration and so on. Then the treaty itself was concluded in 1994 and the first documents uh, complementing the treaty were actually negotiated after 1994 and this period was characterized by an economic and political crisis in the former Soviet Union and therefore most of the former Soviet Union countries including Russia were not active participants in the process. After 1998, a transit protocol started to be negotiated, a transit protocol as an additional document to the Energy Charter, which was never concluded, by the way, but which aimed at clarifying a number of provisions, especially regarding to dispute settlement mechanisms and to the non-discrimination of access to the uh, transit pipeline. And you can imagine that uh, that period was actually Russia's boost in gas uh, supplies and more reaffirmed policy in the former Soviet Union. And in, in uh, turn, the European Union started to consider the energy as one of the priorities of the Union's policies. And at that time, Russia started to attempt to revise the Energy Charter Treaty via the transit protocol, which actually for the European Union didn't make any sense. What is quite important is that for Russia, transit governance aimed at securing the supply chain, including mitigation of any uh, theft of gas or of uh, disruption of supplies. For the European Union, the transit governance aimed at increasing competition and competition became also one of the objectives within the European Union internally. At the same time, after 2006, we observe crisis related to the collapse of governance in EU, Russia, in EU, in, in sorry, Russia-Ukraine relations. These are Russia-Ukraine transit conflicts. Why did this happen? There are a lot of publications about it. I'm not going to uh, focus on it now. However, what is important to understand is that the politicization of the transit issues created a clear barrier for using the multilateral mechanisms. At the same time, after 2005 and practically 2006, the European Union also marginalizes the Energy Charter in a way that prefers actually to export its own market model rather than to continue negotiating a more complex multilateral treaty. So we see a spiral of securitization towards Russia's gas supplies and I would say that the current events in Ukraine in particular uh, the crisis in Crimea would increase the securitization to these supplies, although this political conflict is not yet, at least, related to energy. Few words about Russian specific position on the Energy Charter Treaty. Russia is a signatory of the Energy Charter, and it would be wrong to assume that Russia is not a member of the Energy Charter. However, by 2009, Russia applied the treaty provisionally, which means that the Energy Charter applies as soon as, uh, as long as the treaty doesn't contradict through domestic laws and the Constitution. In 2009, after the crisis, the transit crisis with Ukraine, 
uh, Russia decided to withdraw from the provisional petition. And in 2010, a uh, draft convention on energy security was proposed. And the draft convention doesn't really propose any alternative. There is a much stronger security approach. There is a small novelty, which is an early warning mechanism. And we will see whether it will work now in case of a new transit conflict between Russia and Ukraine. There is an investment chapter, but which lowers down the standards of the Energy Charter Treaty and know that Russian companies are not at all interested in lowering down the investment standards because of the overseas investments of Russian majors outside uh, Russia. And finally of all, transit, in transit issues, the Russia's draft convention does not propose really anything new. So we see that there is no change in transit provisions and therefore the current political situation rather creates a very difficult uh, conditions for the energy charter. So what are the prospects? We must say that the energy charter is not anymore a EU-Russia energy relations mechanism. It's already more and more a form of incorporation and institutionalization of various transnational norms in energy governance, which include investment protection, which include several uh, norms and concepts related to transit of gas, related to non-disruption of gas, related to uh, more technical terms such as um, available capacity and so on. So the energy charter process is already set and is already integrated within a larger uh, set of governance which exists at the transnational level. So I would say that Russian proposal would rather be used in the energy charter process as Russia's position within the energy chest. A second scenario would be that Russian proposal evolves into a different treaty, but we see that it didn't happen. It didn't happen for a very clear reason. A Russian view on energy governance is not even shared by the closest allies of Russia of the customs union, such as Belarus and Kazakhstan. Note quite an interesting thing, that neither of the two closest allies of Russia, Kazakhstan and Belarus, support Russian actions in Crimea, which basically means a certain weakness of Russia in terms of soft power. Hence, we would see that Russia would have more interest in realigning to the multilateral processes rather than opposing to them. As far as the energy dialogue is concerned, we see that actually is a successful uh, communication ground. And since 2009, it includes the early warning mechanism. And it also goes beyond the gas sector. On the contrary, it does not really include the problematic gas sector. It includes, for example, private pilot projects on energy efficiency, technology center, and so on. And here in this sphere, Russia needs the European Union as Russia adopts a number of norms, including the best practice mechanisms on the energy efficiency promotion. So in many ways, we see that the energy dialogue is a successful mechanism and which somehow uh, allows Russia to adopt some of the European Union norms. But uh, here also we have to look at the European Union policy, which more and more characterized by an externalization of domestic policies, which are reflected by the Energy Community Treaty. 
And quite interestingly, Ukraine became a member of the Energy Community Treaty since 2011. And since 2011, Ukraine is committed to adopt the internal market norms, which is actually quite a difficult issue for uh, Russian Gazprom, especially. So, we see that since 2010 and since 2011, uh, Russia and the European Union competed for Ukraine. And uh, maybe the current events in Ukraine is just the culmination of this competition. Just we don't have a crystal ball to say how it would end. Quite importantly, Russia opposes any political expansion of the European Union and conducts more assertive policy in the former Soviet Union and uh, somehow this assertive policy also reflects a fear of some of the political elites in Russia that expansion of the European Union influence, especially in Ukraine, would provide political changes and uh, even political crisis in Russia itself. About Gas Advisory Council, I will be very short and brief about it. It's just to demonstrate that at the industry level, Russia and the European Union cooperate quite a lot. They cooperate on a number of issues related to um, gas uh, transport uh, capacity mechanisms. They discuss quite important issues related to the payback um, mechanisms for natural gas supplies. And you see that actually transport of gas is extremely important in uh, the, uh, in the gas chain itself, which makes it different from any other energy source, from coal or oil, which are not so strongly dependent on transport. And here you also can see that actually transport capacities from Russia are uh, quite costly. Uh, with a third uh, party access regime established in the European Union, um, both European Union com European companies and Russian uh, companies, including Gazprom, were keen to develop a mechanism which avoids the so-called supply capacity mismatch. As you can see on the screen, a five years supply contract can um, be complemented by shorter term transport use, and if the shorter term transport use are only per year, then you can have a transport capacity mismatch or supply capacity mismatch when there is no transport uh, capacity to, to fulfill contracts. So, uh, Russian and European companies are discussing the ways how the gas transport allocation uh, would work in order to avoid gas losses and to optimize the capacity, the transmission capacity, right? So, you can see on the screen, if there is a request for transport capacity, transmission system operator has to look at it, then either the capacity is available, and then there is a capacity is allocated, or the capacity is not available, there is a deficit of capacity, which can be either contractual, uh, when the contracts are signed, but there are enough of capacity, then you have a number of mechanisms, such as auctions, uh, or use it or lose it. Or you can have a physical capacity uh, deficit, which requires a new investment plan. And quite interestingly, Russian and European companies found a common language in addressing these problems. However, the politicization of the gas uh, sector issues hinder the, the industry cooperation. And we can see that Gazprom, Russia's main company, my main supplier, and European companies find the common positions, especially regarding long-term capacity uh, reservations. There are disputes between Russia and the European Union uh, companies. They are related mostly to the modules of the contracts, and especially to the so-called take-or-pay provisions, because for the European companies it's quite important to make the take or pay provisions more flexible. For Russian suppliers, take or pay provisions should not be 
flexible. They have to be rigid. And in addition to that, uh, Gazprom doesn't really understand that uh, the era of producer-based market related to gas price set to the oil price as the producer wish is finished. Now, due to the inflows of LNGs from Qatar, from Australia, and from North America, including the potential LNG markets, which could evolve after 2016, the gas-to-gas -gas competition is becoming stronger, and therefore the um, oil indexation will be somehow readapted. And here you see on general world market scales and transnational gas markets that somehow the upper line in oil brand uh, is not always correlated to the gas price, which is extremely important and um, which is actually the main result of the shale gas development in the United States. So there is a challenge for gas pricing and Gazprom tries to keep the oil indexation, and I must say that the current developments in Ukraine rather hinders Gazprom strategy, rather hinders Gazprom argument, because it pushes the European consumers, especially at the political level, to say we need to depend less on Gazprom and we need to find other solutions, even if these solutions would provide more market risks and more price volatility risks. Because once again, it's quite important, indexation to oil provides a certain stability for the prices, also for consumers. I'm not going to touch here antitrust monitoring against Gazprom. I think there are a lot of things which have been said about. Uh, however, that can become now a very important instrument that the European Commission might use against Gazprom in the current escalation of relationships around Ukrainian crisis. So, some conclusions. We can see that for the European Union, the main concern is the dependency on Russian monopoly. And the ultimate objective would be getting rid of this monopoly. At the same time, in entrance of Ukraine into the energy community treaty, meaning into the wider European energy market, is seen as another policy priority. For Russia, the main point is to revise the energy chart treaty, especially the transit issues, including the dispute settlement mechanisms on transit, and also to avoid the issues related to supply capacity mismatches and going beyond the negative interdependence would be seen as more flexible position on the internal market for the European Union, especially on the regional economic integration organization, whereas for Russia to leave or gradually give up the export monopoly. However, the Ukrainian issue is becoming now the main counterstone for any um, removal of negative interdependence. Thank you very much. For your Thank you, Andre. Um, that was a very nice overview as well, not just talking about gas relations, which is often the focus of eu russia energy relations, uh, but also other uh, methods of en improving our energy relations, including through energy efficiency measures and so on. Um, so thank you very much for that. I'll pass now over to Olga, who will take a few minutes to respond to some of the points that Andre has raised and also will give her own comments. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Andre, for a very interesting presentation. I will try briefly to respond to what Andre said and add a couple of comments of my own, which was basically saying that EU-Russia relations is two monologues rather than um, a dialogue and um, there are a lot of contradictions um, between between the two and the current Ukrainian crisis can bring all these um, uh, contradictions and uh, hidden problems onto the surface. 
uh, as Andre talk, uh, talked about, uh, more short-term consequences, uh, such as potential supply interruptions, either initiated by Russia or by Ukraine. It can be more of a short-term problem. And um, there are also potentially long-term and medium-term medium consequences including the changes to the overall, gradual changes of the overall um, natural gas market with the uh, increased share of uh, liquefied natural gas and um, potential shale gas. So um, it would be just for us to wait and see how this all will develop. And um, of course the fact that um, the current contradictions about the energy charge that also underline it. Uh, the problem there is no working uh, <coughs> multilateral agreement which would include both European Union and Russia um, is an important problem and I would like to see it in the future it's going to um, be revised to both the benefit of the European Union and the Russian Federation. But I think it's unlikely that uh, the European Union would agree for the development of a new treaty and more likely that if something would happen it would be uh, possibly some amendments to the existing um, energy charter treaty. So uh, linking these problems with some more positive development which Andre mentioned including cooperation on energy efficiency and renewable energy. Uh, it is indeed one of the more positive aspects of relationship between the EU and Russia. Uh, and it's probably the least politicized and securitized one. Um, and EU-Russia dialogue um, is one of the forums which um, provide an opportunity to facilitate this cooperation. And um, there are a number of bilateral deals as well between Russia and Germany, Russia and Finland, uh, France, Italy, Denmark, which um, increase cooperation on energy efficiency and renewable energy. One of the uh, positive examples in the recent years was the Russian-Germany Energy Agency, which was supporting energy efficiency projects in uh, Kaliningrad Oblast. It closed in 2013, but it provided access to the German companies to Russian energy efficiency projects. Also, there are more regional ties between Russia and new member states, um, especially in the Baltic region, which also provides the interesting development for the future um, of cooperation on energy efficiency. Of course, it's more a long-term and medium-term um, solutions, and uh, potentially it can bring these two monologues into one dialogue, possibly. So, uh, to conclude my comments, is that, uh, I think that uh, in terms of the current situation around Ukraine, the short-term relations between Russia and the EU may be strained in terms of energy because of the existing problems. Um, but more interesting is how it's going to affect the relationship between Russia and the EU in the long term. Thank you, Olga. We already have a few questions coming in, so I will read these questions and I'll first give Andre time to respond and then Olga, you can come in afterwards. So the first question that we have is that can the energy community regulatory framework for energy play a real positive role in normalizing and desecuritizing the energy relations between the EU, Ukraine and Russia if the latter, the latter is not a contracting party of the energy community? And in what way and how can the energy community influence the European relations with Russia? That's the first question. And we have a second question, which is about the role for the EU in negotiating new gas contracts that have so far been bilateral. And is this needed in the future? So, Andre, I'll pass over to you to respond to those questions. Uh, thank you for very good questions. Uh, first, about the energy community. Well, 
Actually, energy community aims at establishing more market-based relation. And uh, obviously it aims at desecuritizing the relationships. So, uh, yes, Russia is not a member of it, and there will be issues related to the, uh, again, gas uh, supply capacity mismatches at the Ukrainian territory, and indeed uh, that will be an issue which will be again raised at the inter-industry level. But as I have explained before, inter-industry level is much more easy, is much easier than the political level, and is already less securitized than the political level. And from this perspective, I would say that yes, uh, the Energy Community Treaty would rather help in desecuritizing the energy relation as such. So, uh, would be Russia hurt too much with the Energy Community Treaty? I would not say so. With the Nord Stream pipeline, with the South Stream pipeline, plus Ukrainian existing networks, uh, Russia's gas export capacities double the actual volumes supplied to the European Union. So it means that we have twice more of transport capacity compared to we, what we actually ship. So uh, Gazprom as the main exporter would not need to use all of it. And considering the very high level domestic pressure and external pressure on the demonopolization of gas export, we can see that this situation will rather forge, maybe gradual, but export demonopolization. It means that Rosneft, Novatec, maybe Lukoil will be able to ship gas through these networks. Obviously, it's still very hypothetical, but remember, two years ago, nobody would imagine that Russia would go for an LNG export demonopolization. Likewise, I would strongly believe that a gradual pipeline export demonopolization will happen once there is a strong overcapacity compared to the supplies through the European Union. Uh, there was a second part of this question related to the EU role. That was the second one. It was first yeah, yeah, your role in negotiating. Yes, the European Commission tries to gain this role, and not in the way how they would renegotiate the contracts. The European Commission cannot negotiate the contracts. It's not their competence, it's the industry's competence, right? But the European Commission attempts to monitor what is actually written in these contracts. And then there is a debate, which we don't know yet the results of it. Uh, the European Commission addresses two issues. One related to the actual contractual relations, especially in regards of transport capacity use, and there the European Commission has a perfect competence in addressing the issue, saying that Gazprom, you book more capacity than you actually use, so we have to punish you and to force you to book less capacity. And then there is another issue where the European Commission doesn't have a competence, which is the price, right? Because the European Union, it's, European Union institutions cannot regulate the price. However, the European Commission also integrated the price issue into the anti-monopoly uh, monitoring procedure. And we will see how it will uh, work out. I would believe that on the first point, the European Commission has a power on the second point, definitely there are limits, and even the European industry would limit the impact of the European Commission on the price setting. Thank you, Andre. Um, Olga, I'll pass over to you now, but I will also add a, a third question that has just come in as well. Olga, if you could maybe respond to this question. Do you think renewable energy can be a solution to the political conflicts in the region? And you're also welcome to respond to the earlier two questions on the Energy Charter Treaty and on um, the role of the EU. Okay. 
Thank you, Claire. Um, renewable energy um, potential it can be a way to decrease the politicization and securitization of EU Russia relations. But we need to keep in mind that uh, this is still in the early stages of development. So European Union is obviously a leader when it comes to renewable energy and energy efficiency uh, as compared to Russia and renewable energy is very uh, represents very, very limited share of Russian energy mix. Um, However, there is an intensified dialogue between the two sides about development, uh, common um, agreements and uh, development of further legislation on renewable energy. I would say that in the upcoming future, um, energy efficiency would be more productive way of uh, um, facilitating relationship between EU and Russia and renewable energy sources will come along in the future as well. Um, in addition to the previous questions about the role of the European Union in negotiation of the, uh, bilateral deals um, and, and gas contracts, I, I would have to agree with Andre about the, um, the reluctance of the member states to give up uh, more competence to the European Commission, um, uh, but this is a gradual process. The uh, European Commission is trying uh, to gain more uh, competence and maybe the, the uh, escalation of the situation in Ukraine facilitate the um, internal decisions in the European Union, which will potentially give the European Commission more weight. Thank you, Olga. Um, we have three more questions, and again, I'll start with Andre. Um, so I'll read these. Andre, you're also welcome to respond to the question about renewable energy. But the next three questions are about the EC antitrust monitoring against Gazprom. How useful is this approach, and does it not politicize the issue more? Secondly, a question about the dependency of the EU on Russian gas and how it will evolve in the midterm. Can, this is about the role of climate policy of the European Union, the potential of LNG experts from the US and other political pressures that may help to evolve the re relations and the dependency between EU and Russia on gas. And finally, a question on bioenergy. So how do you estimate the recent Russian developments in the bioenergy sector and the idea of, ash of international trade in biofuels? Andre. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting questions. Uh, I will start, obviously, with the renewables. Uh, I would not say that it will de depoliticize. Uh, you see, even gas sector, which is much more politicized than the renewable sector, uh, would not welcome, let's say, the actors participating in the gas sector, would not welcome the current events, right? and the current events hindering even the gas relations. So, and even the gas sector interdependency, which is much stronger, does not uh, create a barrier to these political developments. Uh, therefore, how the renewable energy would help, I don't know. I would uh, not say so. However, you know that Crimea is, the, is quite interestingly, uh, the first renewable energy producer in Ukraine. So uh, we will see how it will work in case if uh, of de facto uh, separation of Crimea from, from Ukraine. Also quite interestingly, if we see um, that Crimea is somehow detached from the rest of Ukraine, most of natural gas and most of the electricity comes from Ukraine. What happens if uh, Ukraine is in the Energy Community Treaty? It will be then part of the European Union internal market, and Crimea will not be, but Crimea, or de facto will not be, right? Uh, and, and Crimea will need to participate in all these market mechanisms to buy electricity and gas from Ukraine. A little bit the same happened in Kaliningrad enclave, which will need to negotiate practically the gas supplies with Lithuania. Uh, then, would the antitrust monitoring increase the politicization? Yes, it will. And uh, we don't know yet the result of 
the procedures how it will happen. I would believe that on the issues of contracts, Gazprom might lose. On the issues of price, Gazprom might win. But we will see how it will go. We will see what will be the end. Uh, uh, about uh, Russian volumes, uh, we actually don't know. We, we can, don't have a crystal ball on that, and uh, that's actually very difficult to estimate. On one hand, yes, climate policies, LNG demonopolization in uh, the United States, maybe shale gas development, and so on. That's actually uh, factors which would decrease European dependence on Russia. However, there is also a very gr much growing market in Asia, Japan, South Korea, China, which attracts most of the LNG supplies from the European Union. So the European Union is somehow losing in this competition because the price is higher in Asia. You can consult my previous slide on it. So we don't know how it will evolve, right? However, what is actually changing is the control over price. Gazprom will not be able to control the price as it used to before. And the last question about the biofuels. Uh, I might not be 100% competent on the biofuel issue. As far as I know, the development of uh, biofuel sector is rather marginal in Russia, but I might be wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Olga, would you like to respond to those questions on antitrust, on LNG exports, and on uh, bioenergy as well? Uh, okay, I will start probably from the biofuel question. And um, um, it's an interesting question, but it's difficult to make any predictions in terms of it. I know that there are someone some of the Russian energy companies, including Gazprom, uh, which work uh, on the development of the biofuels. In case of Gazprom, it's the so-called green gas. And um, uh, there is an ongoing project between Gazprom and Italian companies of the potential of the export of uh, this green gas biofuel to the EU. Um, so there are projects in Russia but again, uh, as in, in case of many other renewable energy sources and alternative energy sources, it's more of an emerging uh, sector um, than uh, as compared as compared to the traditional fossil fuels. Um, but there are projects, including the um, ones led by the leading energy companies such as. Gazprom, uh, among others. Um, I think in terms of other questions, but and, and, um, and they covered them pretty well, so I don't really have much to add to, to the first two. Thanks, Olga. We do have another question here. And that's about, okay, it says, EU advocates advocates a level playing ground as a condition for power trade as lower safety standards in Russian nuclear power production, for example, uh, leads to unfair competition. So how should the EU react to a new transmission lines between Russia and Finland? Andre, you can start. Thank you, very good question. However, I would think that the question is rather about the EU uh, law on competition, right? It's not about really EU-Russia energy relations. Uh, as uh, far as I know, Finland imports electricity from Leningrad power plant, which was modernized with the Finnish investments. So I'm not sure if the issue will be posed there. However, it could be a good question regarding the uh, power imported by Finland from uh, Kolapinus. Likewise, uh, the new 
envisaged new plant, a nuclear power plant in Kaliningrad might face the issue. So we will see. Unfortunately, um, we don't have yet any case about because how can we see whether the European Union has a problem or not is when the European Commission addresses this and then the European Court of Justice might um, go for a case about. Up to now, we don't have any clear sign about whether there is a problem or not. Thank you, Andre. Um, there is uh, one question then that you can respond to, Olga, but I would like to add a question to both speakers. Um, I was struck earlier, Andre, you mentioned that Gazprom has twice the cap transport capacity than is needed. Um, I just want to pose a question to you and to Olga um, about the South Stream pipeline that Russia has been trying to connect with Europe by bypassing Ukraine. What is the future of this project, and is this project also um, logical in the, circumstance, the given circumstances? Um, Olga, you can respond to that and to the previous question about the transmission connections with um, Finland. Okay. Uh, in regards to the South Stream project, I was following uh, it myself of how the you know, unpacking situation in Ukraine can potentially affect the development of this uh, project in future and uh, my understanding at the moment that um, currently the European Union put on hold uh, the political side of discussion about the South Stream project and the um, discussion on the approval of a project by the European Union side but as far as I know the technical aspect of the cooperation um, related to the project is still ongoing and uh, Russian position that they will go ahead uh, with the construction of this project um, in future uh, so we will have to wait and see what will happen with Crimea in the recent uh, in the upcoming weeks but uh, so far I think that Russia will try to go ahead with this and um, it will depend on what decision the European Union will make after um, after the uh, Crimea referendum of how they will decide to proceed about um, I'm afraid I'm not an expert on um, nuclear power production between Russia and Finland. So um, I, I don't have anything to add to, to that question. I'm afraid. Um, Andre, I'll pass yeah, Andre, immediately to Andre if you want to respond to the question on that stream, and then I think we will have to. Yep. Yes, oh, sorry. Didn't see that I didn't start sharing. Right, definitely South Stream Pipeline is extremely good question. Thank you very much. Mm, right, uh, it's quite interesting to see that the European Union, European countries especially, are now stuck in between two hard solutions or two hard decisions, right? Difficult decisions. One of them. One of them is how to influence Kremlin not to use force in Crimea. And obviously, counseling South Stream would be one of the measures. Another uh, thing is that uh, European Union and the European Union member states do not want to harm much the investors. And the investments into the South Stream have already been happening. And uh, these two dilemmas are not resolved yet. And actually, the best example to see how these dilemmas evolve is to look at the German um, policy discourse regarding Russia, right? Because it's a constant balance between a hard step and the soft step. Uh, therefore, um, responding to the question whether South Stream is relevant. 
it depends very much on how the European Union and its member states will consider a necessity in escalating relations with Russia. Thank you very much, Andre. I see that there is a last question coming in. Um, this is about the renewable energy once again, which typically involves less interdependency between countries and is stronger on distributed generation. So this, the questioner wanted to know if the renewable energy sector would be relatively less vulnerable to political conflicts as opposed to gas, for example. Um, and if this is a way to supply the power needs without having pa the power sector to be affected by political issues. Mm -hmm. If either of you would like to respond to this comment, you're very welcome to. We still have a couple of minutes. Andre. Uh, yes, indeed. Moreover, uh, renewable energy actually is a field of cooperation because you know that the costs of the renewable energy installations in the European Union are rising. So there are some interesting uh, proposals evolved within the World Bank, for example, and now proposed at the Russian and the European Union member states levels, is to trade the capacities of renewable energy installations to the European Union, right? To account them, to account the current electricity exports, which are not based on the renewables, for the renewables in case if Russia or Russian companies installed more renewable energies inside. Uh, however, uh, it would be still unrealistic economically to imagine that the renewable energies occupy a significant role in the fuel energy mix. Uh, and I would also underline that the gas sector as such produces minor conflicts, minor disputes and minor disagreements, which are at the inter-industry levels resolved. So the, another issue is a political escalation, which we see and which is not directly related or even not related to the gas issues. On the contrary, the current political situation in Crimea rather hinders uh, trends towards po or like attempts to positive interdependency. And you could see also that the previous securitization of the energy sectors uh, weakened the energy charter. So uh, the question is the other way around. It's not about what energy we use, but how politically we address the question. Olga, would you like to come in on this question as well? Um, just a quick um, comment maybe. But, um, I agree that uh, renewable energy sector offers less um, ground for political escalation, but uh, as compared to the uh, relationship involving traditional fossil fuels, um, the share of the production of renewable energy in Russia is significantly lower. Um, in the European Union, the situation is better, but still um, in the upcoming future, um, oil and gas trade uh, would be uh, more important. Uh, so it's more a long term development, um, how it will go. So that, that, that's it from me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Olga, and thank you, Andre. We will have to close the seminar now. So I would first like to say thank you to everyone for your participation and for your active engagement in our discussion. I think the one main conclusion we can draw from our discussion today is that EU energy and EU Russian energy relations are not just about natural gas although that plays a great role. There are more uh, elements involved, including renewable energy, energy efficiency, and the wider political context, including the EU's neighborhood and the Russian neighborhood relations. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for your participation. Thank you also especially to Olga and Andre for your excellent comments and presentations. Um, before we say goodbye, I would like to remind everybody that you can follow the, the webinar series on the Institute for European Studies website. That's www.ies.be. So please keep an eye on that for future webinars. Thank you all and goodbye. <laughs>